I will use my iPhone here to show you how this works. So you will see my screen, my iPhone, and let's do a commit that is not working like this one. If you like programming stuff, search no further. Hit subscribe now and activate the notification bell as quickly as you can. In the last video, we learned about Git hygiene and why writing commit messages that aren't just a shallow replacement for the diff is a must. If you are like, huh? you most likely haven't seen the video by now. I will link it everywhere and also put it at the end of this video. So watch it later. In this video, we will examine Git hooks and how you can use them to ensure that only your best commits enter the Git log. We will start with some theory and after that, we will get our little programmer fingers dirty and build our very own git hooks. So make sure to stay to the end. Watch to the end. What are hooks anyway? Hooks are used to tell a software to execute another piece of code as soon as a certain event occurs. In other words, you can use your code to hook into another program. Now, git hooks. Git hooks can be used to hook onto different events during the Git workflow. You can, for example, run code after you check out a branch, before you enter a commit message or when you merge code from another branch. So, how does it work? Each Git hook is just an executable file with a special name. Git is a file-based system, so everything that belongs to a local Git repository is inside the hidden Git folder at the root of the repository. Same goes for the Git hooks, which you have to put into the hooks folder instead of the hidden Git folder. The name of the executable defines on which event you want your code to react. There are four different groups of Git hooks. Commit workflow hooks, email workflow hooks, other client-side hooks, and server-side hooks. The first the first three groups of git hooks are executed on your machine. The server side hooks on the other side are executed on the git server. They are used to enforce certain rules when committing to the git. You might think that client side hooks are enough to enforce all the rules you need, but that is actually not the case. You can always circumvent them if you want or need to, but don't tell anybody. Side note, if you are coming from a web development or DevOps background, you most certainly have heard about webhooks. Webhooks use URLs, which you can define, and as soon as a certain event occurs, they get called. Interestingly, Git hosting platforms like GitHub or GitLab use webhooks to expose the server-side Git hooks so that you can use them to integrate them in your systems, for instance, to trigger a build server. And that is how everything comes together. But in this video, we're not talking about server-side hooks. And I'm quite unqualified to talk about email workflow hooks since I've never used them. So we are left with commit workflow hooks and other client-side hooks. The executables to hook into these events need to have the following names. For all the rest, you find links in the description below. Let's start with pre-commit. Pre-commit is run first when you want to commit something. It is commonly used to run some static analysis, linting, spell checking or other code and style checks on your code prior to a commit. It doesn't take any more parameters and returning a non-zero return value is the way to abort the commit in case it doesn't like what you are trying to commit. I'm glad we had this hook in place. You can always circumvent these checks by adding no verify to git commit. And this might be quite useful when you're working on your private branch. Next up, prepare commit message. Prepare commit message runs before the commit message editor is shown, but after the default commit message was created. You can use this hook to alter the default commit message or to create a completely new one before it is presented to the user. This might be useful to prefill the editor with the ID of the ticket this code changes belong to or to add a checklist for your git commit message rules. This hook receives the path to the file which holds the current commit message as the first parameter. The hook receives the type of the commit as the second parameter. Possible types are message, template, merge, squash and commit. But we don't care about them today. If you want to know more, please remember to check out the links in the description below. After you wrote your commit message, we have to make sure that it's okay. And that is precisely the reason for the commit message hook. We can use the commit message hook to check your commit message for any typos or style issues. And in the likely case that something is wrong, we can return a non-zero exit code and make sure you do it better next time.
Spoiler alert! We will build a commit hook later. That ensures that you follow five of the seven rules for a proper commit message. So please keep on watching. Make the YouTube algorithm happy. And while you're on it, hit the like button for the YouTube algorithm as well. Before I forget, the only parameter this commit hook gets is again the file path to the file that holds the current commit message. After everything is said and done, there is the post commit hook. This one is pretty simple. It gets called after everything is successfully committed. You can use it to trigger an automated build system or to notify your teammates via Slack every time you manage to commit something. But the latter is the more viable option because build systems are mostly triggered by server-side hooks. Do you have any ideas for creative usages of the git hooks? Let me know in the comments below. Two other interesting git hooks are post checkout and post merge. These two could be used to resolve external dependencies. For instance, if you use npm, cocoa pods or any other package manager, you can update your packages after a checkout or a merge. Or you could retrieve some large binary files from a CDN to not have them stored inside of your Git repo. Side note, that basically is what Git LFS is doing. There are a lot more Git hooks for you to explore. A full list is linked in the description below. Let's talk about sharing. And I don't mean to share this video with your friends and family, although that is always a good idea. You took some time off from your normal tasks to write some nice git hooks to help yourself be a better committer. Well done! Now it's time to share them with your team to make them all adhere to your rules. At least as long as they don't find out about the no verify flag anyway. In my opinion the best way to share git hooks is to do three things. First, commit them into the repository. By committing them, they are automatically distributed to your teammates and changes are tracked, which is quite useful if somebody tries to loosen the rules. Second, provide an install script. Installing git hooks is not something that you do every day. So it is always a good idea to chisel this kind of knowledge into a well-crafted script. This will make the adaption of your hooks easier for your lazy teammates. Add a script and help them to succumb to your commit rulership with one simple command. Install hooks. Third, add a paragraph to the readme markdown. After you got promoted for this excellent work on these git hooks, you won't be around anymore and nobody will remember to install these git hooks. The git log will fall into chaos. Unless you add a friendly reminder to your readme markdown. The readme is the perfect place to store some information to help new developers enter the team and existing developers to reset up the project in case they need to switch machines. And now, ladies and gentlemen, get your noise cancelling headphones ready. Enable the dark mode. It is finally time for some coding. I created a folder and now we need a git repository. Here we see we have the git repository root folder here. Inside of the git repository root folder, we see the hooks repository, which contains sample files for all the git hooks that are available for you to hook into. Now we're going to write our own commit hook. First, we want to write a commit hook for the commit message. So we get ourselves a file commit message pi. I will write this stuff in Python just because I like Python a lot. So this commit message hook is getting executed to give us a way to check the commit message that we are about to commit. The parameter the script gets is the path to the file the commit message is in. So this is basically the skeleton of the commit hook script that we are going to write. I will fire up the commit regularly and so that I don't spam the git log, I will just exit with one. Exiting with one will prevent any commits from going through. I also want to check out the number of arguments and the actual argument list that our script is getting when it's executed through git. So let's do a commit now. In order to test out our first script, we have to link it into the hooks folder. And now we can try out a commit. 
And here we go. Our script is executed and shows that we get two arguments. First, we get our commit hook that is executed. And after that, we get the file path to the file that holds the currently edited commit message. When we have a look at the git log now, we see that no commits went through. If we change this one here to a zero and try this again, now we see our printout, but below that we actually see that the commit went through. There we go. What we are going to do now is to write a git commit hook that will check our commit messages for five of the seven rules for a proper commit message. In order to do that, we first need to open the file with the current commit message and get all the lines out of this file. Let's see what we get. So let's switch this back to a one so we don't spam our commit log and let's do a verbose commit this time. And here we go, test. And what we see now is our script printing out all of the lines the commit message. So we see everything that we saw in the editor is actually printed out as well. But we only need to check the first couple of lines. So we need to ignore everything that starts with the hash. And we have this end of commit message identifier, I would say. And when we reach that, we can just simply stop our script and see if everything is good. The first thing that we check is if a line starts with the hash. And if it does, we just ignore it and go on to the next line. The next thing that we want to check is if we hit the end of commit message delimiter. And for that, we check the line to be this here. And then we're done. So let's see how this looks. Test again with some more content this time. This didn't work exactly. Let's put this in front of this line here. This line needs also to be trimmed. Strip. And let's try it again. Test again with some lines. Here we go. Test again with some lines. So now we are breaking our code at the delimiter and we're ignoring everything that starts with a hash. Let's go on. Let's get ourselves a method for checking the lines. Line valid gets the line number and the actual line and will return a boolean to indicate if the line is valid or not. If the line is not valid, we will exit with a one. If not line valid, this is exit one, there we go. And if everything is good, we exit with a zero. One more thing, we want to return false here in order to not spam our git log. In order to get the line number, we will enumerate our array of lines. All right, line valid. We want to get five rules straight. Seven rules for a great commit message. Separate subject from body with a blank line. Limit the subject line to 50 characters. Capitalize the subject line. Do not end the subject line with a period. Use the imperative mood in the subject line. We not going to check for that. Wrap the body at 72 characters and use the body to explain what and why versus how. So we basically need to implement three different rules. A rule for the first line, the subject line, a rule for the blank line after that and a rule for everything else. But first let's get ourselves a little show rules method. Show rules print rules. Every time something goes wrong we Show the rules. Let's go to the validation. We have a rule for the first line, we have a rule for the second line and everything else. Let's start with the second line because it is quite simple. We want the second line to be empty. So we just return true or false if the length of the line with all white space removed is equal to zero. All right. For every line after the subject line and the blank line, we want to make sure they are not longer than 72 characters. So we basically just do the same and check for the line 
stripped to be less or equal 72 characters long. All right, and now off to the first one. And the first one is a little bit more complicated and we are going to use regular expressions for that. We want to match a regular expression and the expression goes like this. Our string must start with a capital letter. After that, I don't care so much. I just want it to be less than 49 characters. And the line is not supposed to end on any punctuation. So we can have numbers, capital or non-capital letters, and a white space is okay for me as well. And this should be the end of the line. So if we now count, we have one character, then we have up to 48 characters and a last one which is not a punctuation. So this line in total is not longer than 50 characters. So we have now separate subject line from the body with a blank line. Check. Limit the subject line to 50 characters. Check. Capitalize. Check. Do not end the subject line with a period. Here we go. Wrap the body at 72 characters. Here we go. That's it. That is our line validation. Yeah, let's, let's try it out. Git commit. Edit. Fancy. Commit. Hook. Oh, okay, there's something wrong. Of course, we didn't tell the regular expression what should be matched. Let's put this in here as well. Here we go. That was close. You almost spo spoiled the eternal git lock. Please follow these rules. Didn't work. So rule number three, make it capitalized. And, um, but I don't want to commit now. So we add a period at the end. Didn't work. All right, let's, let's make it a verbose message and go with add fancy commit hook. If you like this video, Please remember to like and subscribe. There we go. This worked. Um, let's have a look at the git lock. Here we go. Add fancy commit hook. Perfect. All right, this was great, but I want to do one more thing actually. I installed this Python library, which I can use to control my Philips Hue light bulbs. I think it's a funny idea to use this library to control my Philips light bulb from my commit hooks. Let's do that. For that, I have some code prepared because we need to have the right IP address and names of the light bulbs as well as color values. I have a little snippet here, which I just copy paste. So I have, I defined two methods, hue red and hue green, both use the P hue library and I get the bridge. I connect to the bridge by using the IP address. I get my light bulb which is a light strip that is located up there I set it bright and set the right color values so when I do something wrong I want to make it red and if everything works fine let's make it green and let's have some fun I will use my iPhone here to show you how this works so you will see my screen my iPhone let's try this out let's do a commit that is not working like this one Woo! <laughs> it worked. All right, okay, let's do something that should work. Add Philips Hue Controls. And here we go. How cool is that? That's it for today. I will clean this code up, upload it to GitHub. A link is in the description below. I will also add an install script and a readme for you. If you have ideas how to extend these basic examples, leave a comment below or better, fork the repo, make your changes and create a pull request. I love to see what you're coming up with. I'm out for today. See you next time.